I invite you to turn in your Bibles this morning to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, the first three verses of this chapter will be the main text of our study together this morning. Ephesians 4, verses 1 to 3. There Paul writes and says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with all patience, with bearing one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Paul deals with doctrinal matters for the most part in chapters 1 through 3 of the book of Ephesians. And then, beginning in chapter 4, he begins to talk about everyday life Christianity and applying these doctrinal matters, so to speak, into your life. And so he talks more to us as Christians about uh, how to live and how not to live while talking about doctrinal matters in the first part of the book. And that's just a very general, broad way to kind of divide the book in half. And so beginning in chapter 4, he speaks of walking worthy of uh, of the walk that we've been called to be a part of. The King James uses the expression, walk worthy of the vocation that you've been called uh, to walk in. The word walk is one of the, uh, is one of the words that's used in the, in the scripture to describe our behavior. When we talk about a man's walk, we sometimes use the expression, walk the walk. If you're going to wa walk the walk and, and talk the talk, you remember that expression? Uh, the idea is, if you're going to talk it, you need to walk it in your life as best you can. And so, um, that has to do with behavior. George Gallup, <clears throat> in 1987, wrote these words. Uh, and, of course, Gallup polls we're familiar with. But here's what he said. And the words are a little unsettling as he writes about uh, people who claim to be Christians in the world today. And this, of course, uh, was in 1987, which is getting close to being 30 years ago. There's little difference in ethical behavior between the churched and the unchurched. He says you can't tell a lot of difference between people who claim to be church people, quote unquote in a broad sense, and those who don't. There's as much pilferage and dishonesty among the churched as the unchurched. Now, I want you, whether you agree with that or not, to think about what he's saying and and to consider, and especially not to think about it from the light of your neighbor, just to make sure that in your own life, uh, your behavior as a Christian is with consistent with the claim of being a Christian. Now, we not, can't do that perfectly, but we can do it faithfully. Gallup went on to say, I am afraid that applies pretty much across the board. Religion per se is not really life-changing. That should be, it can be, but he's saying for a lot of people who claim to be religious, their religion is not changing their life. People cite it as important, for instance, in overcoming depression, but it doesn't have primacy, or it's not primary, in determining behavior. Does your relationship with God, your claim to be a Christian, if you are a Christian today, does it control your behavior? These words were written in, also in 19... No, this, another quote I've got in a minute comes from 1987. This is in a book by Charles Swindle, uh, who's a very well-known religious writer. And the book is called John the Baptizer. And here is, he's quoting another individual, and here's what Swindle wrote. In his book, I Surrender, Patrick Morley writes that the church's integrity problem is in the misconception that we can add Christ to our lives but not subtract sin. It is a change in belief without a change in behavior. He goes on to say, It is revival without reformation, without repentance. For some is his point. For many, I would probably be a better way of saying it is his point. And uh, the statement, uh, the phrase in that that, that got, got me and made me want to uh, mention it today, he said, as far as many people is concerned, there is a misconception in life that you can change your, your belief without changing your behavior and that be pleasing to God. In the Bible, there's another word then that, that we think of in our lives um, that describes for us our relationship with God, that describes for us how we ought to live. Uh, there is walk, there is behavior, and then there's this word, that which we're called to live. And then comes the word, in, li in light of all this, our, the word vocation. And in some translations, Paul, and Paul writes here in Ephesians chapter 4, and the King James says you ought to walk worthy of the vocation that you're called in. And the, then here we come in the English Standard Translation. It takes the word vocation out and substitutes the word calling in there and says, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. 
to what have you been called today? It's not some mysterious voice in the dark that we're talking about here. God lets us know our calling by where he places us in this world. Where has he placed you in this life? What opportunities has he set before you in this life? What are you doing with his word which tells you how to live and how not to live? Even the gospel is what calls us according to 2 Timothy chapter, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 in verse 14. And so the calling of God, what God expects of us in our lives has a lot to do with where he puts us in this world and the opportunities that he places in our paths, and the word which teaches us how to live and how a lot to live. So what to what have you been called? Of course, all of us are called by the gospel to be his children, to be Christians, and that involves not only a change in belief, if, we're not, if, we, know, if, we've, if we haven't believed in Jesus and if we, have, if we don't believe in his word, that has to change. And not only that, belief in his word, belief in him requires a change in life. In the book of Ephesians, the word walk is used six times. The word walk is the word that we use for behavior. Six times. And it's the time that is used in chapter 4 that we're keying in on this morning. But very quickly, notice with me chapter 2, verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. How do I walk in good work? It has to do with my behavior. It has to do with our our behavior or whether or not we're behaving in our lives as God's children. In chapter 4, verse 17, the word is used again. Chapter 4, and this time, verse 17. Paul says, we've got to get on the right page here. Now this I say in testifying the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their minds. There's a way not to walk. There is a way to walk. In other words, there is a way to behave, and there is a way not to behave. In chapter 5, the rest of these are found in chapter 5, and we've got three more here, and then we'll come back to the sixth one, which is in the first part of uh, chapter um, 4, where we read our text this morning. Uh, Chapter 5, verse 2, and walk in love. As Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Walk in love. Behave yourself as one who loves God and with all of his heart and loves his neighbor as himself, as Jesus taught. And also in chapter 5, verse 8, one of the, ne- the next to the last time the word is used. For at one time you were in darkness, but now you are light in the world. Walk as children of light. Behave yourself as a child of the light. And then finally... Verse 15 of chapter 5, Paul says, Look carefully, then, how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. In the King James, he tells us to walk circumspectly. Circumspectly. Open your eyes. See what's around about you. It's being careful when you walk. And that's the way the ESV translates it there. And so... It is this time that it is used in Ephesians 4 in verse 1 that I've already read this morning that I want us to to think about this morning, how to walk worthy. Walking worthy doesn't mean being self-righteous. It doesn't mean being hypocritical. It doesn't mean being that we think we're superior to others. It doesn't mean uh, walking, uh, believing without realizing that, that we have responsibility as far as our behavior is concerned. The worthy walk Paul describes for us here And he says it has to do, as I mentioned earlier, with our vocation. The vocation wherein we have been called. And so I ask you this morning, early in our our lesson, just a few minutes ago, what is your, I didn't say it this way, but what is your vocation? As far as the Christian life is concerned. Where has God placed you in this world? Steve Brown wrote these words some time ago. In the 11th century, King Henry III of Bavaria grew tired of court life and the pressures of being a monarch, of being a king, a dictator, or, or su- uh, the supreme leader. He made application to Prior Richard as a lo- at a local monastery, asking to be accepted as a contemplative and spend the rest of his life in the monastery. In other words, I want to go live in the monastery. I don't have any responsibilities. I don't want to, have to make any de- judgments or decisions. I don't want to be king anymore. I just want to live in the mon- a quiet, peaceable life in the monastery. Your Majesty, King Prior Richard said to him, do you understand that the pledge here is one of obedience? That will be hard for you because you have been a king. I understand, King Henry said. The rest of my life I'll be obedient to you as Christ leads you. And then Prior Richard said to him, then I will tell you what to do. Go back to your throne and serve faithfully in the place where God 
has put you. And so it is said that when King Henry died, a statement was written, and I quote, The king learned to rule by being obedient. The king learned to rule by being obedient. May that be said of all of us, that in our lives we do what it is that God expects of us, that we follow through, that we finish the course, that we keep our responsibilities, that we look at the place in this world where God has put us. Are we where we should be or do we need to move? And when we get where we should be, are we looking at the opportunities that come our way and are we living for God and putting him first? Are we walking worthy of living the Christian life? That doesn't mean are you walking perfect, but it does mean are you walking faithful. It does mean that we've got to get away from this mindset. I... To be a Christian, I just believe in Jesus. It doesn't affect my life. It doesn't change my life. I can stay in sin, literal, willful, deliberate sin. I can, my life doesn't have to be, my behavior doesn't have to change to be a Christian. But the fact of the matter is that Jesus controls our behavior when we surrender our lives to him if we're truly walking for him. And he says, Paul says, our walk is to be a walk worthy of the vocation or the calling to which we have been called. And basically Paul is telling us, that if we claim to be Christians, we ought to act like it. And I hope today that that is your resolve in your life. You won't do it perfectly, but you can, as I've said so many times, do it faithfully. The word worthy, as I understand it, has to do with weight. And so the idea seems to be that my conduct should weigh as much as my talk or my calling. When you compare them, my conduct and what I claim in life, they ought to weigh out, they ought to balance in the scales. The idea of worthy then suggests the idea of weight. It should reflect then that my conduct should reflect that I'm a child of God. No one should be able, someone has wisely said, no one should be able to look at the way you act as a Christian and be able to honestly say, if that is a Christian, then I want no part of it. No one should be able to say that. Now, anyone can look at your life as a Christian and say they're not perfect, but no one is. But surely your life, for example, will not turn people off to the point that they'll say, if that's what it's all about, I don't want anything to do with it. Our walk should weigh as much as our talk if it's worthy. So what does Paul suggest or tell us here about the worthy walk? He said the worthy walk is a walk of lowliness, and that word means basically humility. Uh, someone has suggested humility is realizing that others are more important than you. It's realizing that the world does not revolve around you. It's being willing to let others receive more attention than you do. And it's letting others have their way even if you think your way is better. That's one way to describe humility. Jefferson Davis is cred credited as saying this many years ago, Never be haughty to the humble. Excuse me, never be haughty to be humble. And never be humble to be haughty. And so in life, we are reminded, just as Paul said about his own life, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 15, verse 9, I am the least of the apostles. Then later in Ephesians 3 and verse 8, I am the very least of all the apostles. And then 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15, a little bit later on in his life, I am the foremost of sinners. Or as the King James says, I am the chief of of sinners. It seems to get progressive. Uh, some have suggested the way Paul is saying this in his, in his writings, uh, the, the Corinthian statement is made first, then the Ephesian statement, and then later in Paul's life, um, the, uh, the statement in 1 Timothy. And it seems that he's getting more uh, humble as time goes on. It seems to be more intense in what he's saying. It's an interesting thing to think about from, from that standpoint. It's, and and it's, it's as if Paul's getting greater in God's service as he gets lower or he gets more and more humble in his life. I found this to be an interesting um, statement I found this morning as far as preparing uh, for this lesson. Humility and a, pa and a passion for praise are a pair of characteristics which together indicate growth in grace. The Bible is full of self-humbling or men bowing down before God and also men who at the same time give praise to God. And it's just the author is suggesting this to us as, uh, as he writes about this. He says, the more humble we are, the more praise we give to God, so it seems. As we take less credit for ourselves, we give more credit to God for the blessings that he gives us in life. And so, in our life, and this, this incidentally was written by James Packer many years ago, 1986. So most of my, all of my quotes this morning have been old ones. And of course, the greatest example of humility that we might look at is Jesus, our Savior. 
So we need to remember, sometimes in life we get filled with pride in what we think we feel is, is so important and so much more important than what anybody else thinks or says. And we think in life that what we have to say then, because it's so important, is what everybody ought to listen to. Uh, and whether they listen to anybody else or not, we need to be humble. Paul says part of walking the walk is being humble. And remembering the example of Jesus, that he was humble even to the death on the cross. We see humility in the life of Paul and him willing to say, he was overwhelmed with God's grace. He was overwhelmed with thanksgiving as he expressed that, but he also, in talking about his own life, realized that he had sinned in his life. And so that's why he could say, I'm the foremost of sinners. I'm the chief sinners. He was not trying to say, I'm the worst person who's ever lived. He's saying to us, I've sinned in my life and I need God's forgiveness. He was humble about that. And as he lowered himself before God, God lifted him up. And he lifted up in praise for God for all that God had done for him. And so show me humility and, and I'll show you thanksgiving, gratitude, and praise for God. When you, show, when, you show, when you show me a person that never expresses gratitude to God, never expresses thanksgiving to God, in prayer and by the life we live, more than likely, that person has a pride problem, among other things. Maybe, think, maybe they think they did all they've done in their lives on their own. Even the messes we make, sometimes we feel that way. Well, I have to move on. Not only does humility, in, or is humility involved in the, in the walk that God expects us to live and walking in the Christian life, our behavior, so is meekness or gentleness as it's described in God's word in this context of Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. A.W. Tozer once wrote, The meek man is not a human mouse afflicted with a sense of his own inferiority. Rather, he may be in his moral life as bold as a lion and as strong as Samson, but he has stopped being fooled about himself. He has accepted God's estimate of his own life. He knows he is weak and helpless as God declared him to be, but paradoxically, in other words, in, all, it's in contrast to that, he knows at the same time that he is in the sight of God of more importance than angels. In himself, nothing. In God, everything. And that is his motto. We realize that in ourselves we are nothing. But in the, also, even though we may be strong, that strength is under God's control. Meekness, as many have said, does not mean weakness. Jesus was described as meek and lowly in heart in his life, but he had righteous anger that would cause him to cast the money changers out of the temple when the need arose and he did that on at least two occasions and so strength under control power under control that's a part of walking the wall get it under control get your life under control be humble before god that's that's a christian that's swelled with arrogance and pride a christian that's out of control uh in his life whether it's his temper or in, in, in living in sin that's not walking the wall and then the word long-suffering is used next in our text of Ephesians chapter 4. I read that the idea of the word long-suffering there is to endure with unruffled temper. Another word, another word that we could use there for that word would be patience as we deal with uh, other people. And so are you able in your life to go through trials without blowing your cool? Sometimes I guess we all do that. But as one fellow wrote, can you take it on the chin without getting hit on the uh, without hitting the ce ceiling, so to speak? Can, does your temper fly loose uh, with the different things that happen your happen in your life? And then number four, that was number three, long suffering. There is the word forbearance, and it's a very similar word. Some suggest, though, and I thought it was interesting to note this, that the word forbearance has to do not so much with just general things that we have to deal with and be patient about, but it's dealing with people. Forbearance is the, how do you deal with people? You know, there are all kinds of situations in life that frustrate us, but how do we deal with people that frustrate us? Maybe they shouldn't be frustrating us. Maybe it's our attitude in the first place. Maybe it is that that is a, you know, all of us can be frustrating people from time to time. And so while patience deals with all, or, or long-suffering would deal with all situations, some suggest that this word means how do you deal with people? How do you hold up? How do you bear up? How do you endure when other people are frustrating you? Have you ever noticed that many times in life we, we can become so critical of others? We don't 
We want the preacher to be perfect. We want the elders to be perfect. We want the class teachers to be perfect. We want every person sitting around us to be perfect. We want everyone to be perfect except sometimes ourselves. And we hold others to a higher standard than we live our own lives. And that's, Jesus says, is hypocritical. Hold yourself to just as high a standard as you hold others. And not only that, hold everyone, including yourself, to the standard of God's Word. Not to something beyond it that goes beyond what the Word teaches. And certainly not something that ignores the teachings of God's Word at the same time. How do we then, forbear, or how are we doing it? Forbearing one another. If we're going to do that, we have to realize that we have to forgive one another. We have to forgive one another of our fault, of their faults and shortcomings, and we, as we expect them to forgive us of our faults and our shortcomings as well. This has to be done in the love of the Lord as we serve him and as we love one another with all of our hearts. And then next in our list, in verse 3, Paul says, we must strive for unity if we're going to walk worthy. We must not be divisive. Our, our object in life is to, as Paul says, we ought to endeavor, as the King James says, endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. That doesn't mean that we compromise on everything, unless it's a matter of opinion, and then it really, a matters of opinion don't matter. We don't compromise on matters of doctrine. We have to stand true to what God says in his word. But not everybody's going to think like us. Not everybody's going to say the same thing in the church that we do. Not everybody's going to act like we do, but we have to be united. We have to be willing to be uh, agreeable. We have to either agree with one another, or if we don't, we need to talk it out till we do. And if we've talked it out in matters of opinion and we still disagree in matters of opinion, we need to agree to disagree peaceably and be united. Now, in matters of doctrine, that's another matter. I'm not talking about that. We have to stand on what the Word of God says. But in order to do all of this, we have to be willing to talk to one another. We have to be willing to listen to one another. And sometimes we like to talk, but we don't like to do the listening. We have to be willing to go to one another. And what I mean by that is Jesus taught, if your brother offends you, go to him. Not to your neighbor and not to everybody else in the church building but, that, but your brother. But whoever offends you, go to them and tell them and talk it out and listen to one another and get this thing made right. And then Jesus also saw, taught, if you are the offender, go to the one you offend. So both have responsibility. If I'm offended, I need to go to you. If you offend me, um, I need to go to you. And at the same time, if I offend you, I need to go, I need to, go to you. It, it works both ways. We need to meet one another halfway, coming and going in the process of all of that. If we're going to be, be united, we have to do it. We have to listen. We have to talk before we can listen. We have to go to one another. Either when we are the offendee or the offender, as someone has said, we need to go. And we need to be willing to work with one another in matters of opinion. Just because we don't agree, it doesn't make us enemies. But sometimes that's the way it is. He doesn't agree with me, and therefore I'm having nothing to do with him is the, is the attitude. So Paul goes on in this context just very briefly as we close this morning. That was the last of the, the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace was the last of the things that he mentions there. But he reminds us, you know, there's unity in lots of ways in the church. There's, there's peace because of certain things. And, and Paul mentions these ones that, that follow in the context, verses 4 through 6. There's one body. There's one spirit. We know that to be the Holy Spirit, the body to be the church. He goes on to say one hope. That hope is in Christ Jesus in his word. One Lord, the Lord Jesus. Just like there's one spirit, there's one Lord Jesus. One faith or one body of truth is the idea. One baptism. Um, that he mentions there as well. Baptism, immersion into Christ for the remission of sins. And one God, or one God the Father who is above all. We have these things in common. There's much to be united about. We don't compromise on doctrine, but in matters of opinion, we work together. We work it out. We listen. We talk. And we go to one another when we offend one another in whatever way we can need to. Walking worthy. Our time's gone. There's so much more that could be said. And I hurried because I had so much that was in my notes. I wanted to get to the basics of the whole lesson. I wonder today if you are in a position where you can't walk worthy because you're not his child. You can't walk worthy of the vocation where you've been called because you've not answered that call yet, the call of God's word, to become a child of God, to be saved from your sins.
The Bible teaches us to be saved today. We must believe that Jesus is God's Son, Hebrews 11, 6. We must not only believe in Him, but repent. And repent means a change of life. Remember, it's not only belief in Jesus, but it requires a change of behavior. And that process begins with repentance and stays with us throughout our lives. The Bible teaches us not only must we repent as believers, but we must confess Christ as the Son of God. And then it also teaches us that we must be immersed, baptized for the remission of our sins, Acts 2 and verse 38. Have you done that? You become his child. You're added by the Lord to his body, the church. The instance that you do that. You're raised to walk in newness of life. Water doesn't remove sin. God does. The blood of Jesus does. But we have to get into the water to obey God's commands. To be buried after having died to sin. We are buried with him in that liquid tomb and raised to walk in newness of life. That which represents that which salvation makes salvation possible. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. We die to sin in repentance. We're buried with him. We're raised to walk in newness of life. Have you done that? And as a child of God today, maybe you've been a Christian for a long time. Have you forgotten your way? Are you no longer walking worthy? The word worthy means wait. Does your walk weigh out to your talk? To walk worthy means they balance out. There's as much to your walk as there is to your talk. Even then, that walk won't be perfect. It has to be humble. It has to be forbearing. It has to be unifying. It has to be that which God describes in his word as, as, as one who is faithful. And you won't do it perfect, but you can do it faithfully. And some of us have forgotten our way. And as Christians, we're no longer walking the walk. Maybe even no longer talking the talk. I hope today you'll make changes in your life as publicly as the sin is known in your life as a Christian. Repent of it, confess that there's wrong in your life, and ask God's forgiveness in prayer. We'll pray with you if there's a matter that needs to be taken care of in a public way today because it's known publicly. And so Paul says, I therefore the prisoner for the Lord urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Come if we can help you as we stand and sing.